So we've entitled today's roundtable discussion, Is Singapore Ready for Renewable Energy? And of course, this begs the question, what is renewable energy? Now there are lots of definitions out there. The nuclear industry says nuclear is renewable. The coal industry says that clean coal is renewable. We don't really consider those technologies renewable here at the LKY School. We generally classify renewable technologies into three areas. The first is for electricity and power. You see the ubiquitous wind turbine to the left of the screen. You see biomass and waste energy facilities in the middle with the truck where you can harvest energy crops and energy waste to make electricity. You've got solar photovoltaic panels at the bottom which convert sunlight directly into electricity. You've got hydropower, both big and small, which does the same. And you've got geothermal, which uses the heat of the earth uh, to produce electricity, mostly in the United States and some parts of Asia. The second type usually is in the transportation sector, where you have what are called alternative fuels. Now, the top shows you corn being harvested in the United States to produce ethanol. There's been a lot of press recently about ethanol and whether it makes sense to actually convert it to transportation fuels. In the bottom, you see sugarcane being transformed into ethanol as well uh, in Brazil, which is one of the world leaders of ethanol manufacturing. You've got biodiesel in the bottom right-hand corner. That's a refinery in the Midwest part of the US. Uh, and then you have other types of various alternative fuels, some that use wasted heating oil, et cetera, that can also be used to power your vehicle. Now, are there any astute members in the audience who can tell me what the third category of <laughs> renewable energy is that I haven't yet mentioned? Solar. We mentioned solar. Energy saving. Energy saving. Energy efficiency is often, although not always, considered a renewable resource. And energy efficiency usually refers to either conservation, doing the same with less energy, or improving the efficiency of certain industrial processes, like switching, say, uh, wood to natural gas, or switching incandescent light bulbs to compact fluorescent light bulbs. And we're going to hear about some of the energy efficiency opportunities today when we talk, uh, by some of the experts on the panel who talk a lot about buildings and construction. Now, why is it that we decided to have a roundtable on renewable energy? Uh, it's a good question. And we've given it a lot of thought and have thought, well, there are probably at least three good reasons. The first of which deals with simply energy demand. <clears throat> World demand and consumption of energy is expected to grow significantly in the next 20 or 30 years. This graph shows you energy consumption per capita versus the gross national product per capita. And you can see the US and Canada to the far right, which consume a lot of energy per person. But the rest of the world, especially the China, Brazil, Argentina, and the world average, which are far to the left of the graph, show you that these countries consume virtually no energy compared to the incredible amounts consumed in Europe and the United States. If the goal is to enable these countries to have the same standard of living as the United States, they're going to have to consume more electricity and energy. We're going to need pretty much every technology we've got, including renewables. Second reason is climate change. This graph shows projected annual CO2 emissions from 2003, I think, is when the graph was compiled. This is based on data from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it simply shows that China, the US, and Europe, under business as usual, will continue to emit vast quantities of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The International Energy Agency has even said that between now and 2050, there will be a 137% increase in emissions. So they're going to more than double. And the United States is fond of telling everyone that last year, the United States was no longer the world's biggest emitter. It was China, in absolute terms. So we are faced with an incredible challenge, of course, of confronting climate change and finding sources of energy that don't emit greenhouse gases. Third reason, the reason is energy security. Depletable fuels like coal, natural gas, and oil are found in very few countries and significant reserves around the world. And so it gives rise to a whole plethora of security problems with getting those fuels from where they are on the ground to where they are needed most. Fourth reason is simply what's called externalities and the price of energy. This graph, which is complicated and full of lots of numbers, simply shows what the true costs of electricity would be if you included all of what are called negative externalities. So occupational deaths and mining and transportation, it includes climate change, it includes maybe effects on GDP 
from energy shocks. It includes air pollution like sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and acid rain. And if you include all of these costs, well, renewable energy resources and energy efficiency are usually the cheapest sources of electricity generation. Another, so with these four advantages, we've seen a lot of action globally in favor of renewable energy. In the United States, more than 30 states as of last month have endorsed renewables through renewable portfolio standards, which are obligations that force utilities to deploy a certain percentage of renewable power by a certain date. So if you can see the graph, uh, Hawaii is supposed to get 20% of their electricity from renewable resources by 2020. The most aggressive targets are actually California, Nevada, and a couple of the co uh, states on the East Coast, like New York, are talking about them as well. So there's a lot of action in the U.S. to support renewable power and ethanol with outrageously large subsidies in the farm bill. In Europe, countries have embraced what are called feed-in tariffs and renewable portfolio standards to promote renewable energy. A feed-in tariff is simply a set contract that gives them a fixed guaranteed price over the lifetime of that generator. So if you wanted to build a solar panel, you could probably sign a contract with a utility in Denmark or Germany to get, say, 40 or 45 cents per kilowatt hour as long as that solar panel produces electricity for the next 20 years. And almost every country in Europe has promoted renewables with some type of policy mechanism. This very busy slide is from data compiled by the United Nations this year, which shows the statistics for the renewable energy industry as a whole, not including energy efficiency, just including electricity and transportation. A couple of key numbers pop out. Last year, renewable energy was a $71 billion industry. Um, major countries that are actually producing renewable energy don't just include the United States and Europe. You also see a lot of action in China and Brazil, and Turkey, and India. You also see that the renewable energy share of global energy consumption has grown significantly to about 18% of energy as a whole. And most of that is hydropower and biomass. And you also see that a lot of, renewal, a lot of electricity generation is coming from renewable resources. Uh, about 18.4% if you include hydroelectric, which means more electricity is generated from renewables than nuclear as of last year and a couple of years before. So all of this begs a very simple question for members of this panel. If, as this graph shows, Belgium, Cyprus, Croatia, Algeria, Liberia, and a couple of other developing countries can wholly support and endorse renewable energy, can Singapore?